Hey guys, before we get started today, I need you to do me a favor. In order to support the show, we need the help of some great advertisers. It's how we keep the content free and frequent. In order to find great advertisers, we need to learn a little bit more out of you. Please do me a huge favor. Go to podsurvey.com slash notsam and take a quick anonymous survey that's going to help us get to know you a little better. That way, we can show advertisers just how great you guys are. Plus, once you've completed the survey, you can choose to enter for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Of course, terms and conditions apply. Do me that favor. Go to podsurvey.com slash notsam, N-O-T-S-A-M, podsurvey.com slash notsam. Thanks for your help. Today's episode of Not Sam Wrestling is brought to you by Comedy Central's Roast Battle. What is Roast Battle? Imagine the perfect combination of stand-up comedy, rap battles, and professional wrestling all in one place. Join Brian Moses and DJ Coach T for Roast Battle, the podcast, as they bring you weekly live battles from the world-famous comedy store in Hollywood, as well as behind-the-scenes interviews with the industry's best comedians. You'll hear some insensitive jokes, some politically incorrect jokes, but every joke you hear comes from a place of love. Subscribe now to Roast Battle for new episodes every Thursday in your podcast feed. This podcast is Not Sam Wrestling. This is Not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. That sound can only mean one thing. Welcome to another episode of Not Sam Wrestling. What is this, episode 226, I want to say? I'm not looking at it right in front of me, but it feels like we've done 226 of these episodes. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for all the great feedback we got on last week's episode with Diamond Dallas Page. Thank you for all of the feedback we got over the weekend, or we, I should mean I, got uh, over the weekend about my appearance on the WWE Elimination Chamber kickoff show. Thank you to Finn Balor for his feedback on my comments on the Elimination Chamber kickoff show. The whole thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And welcome, of course. Uh, this is going to be a, a big seven days. The next seven days are big for me, for you, for this podcast, for fans of this podcast. And that's because we have another mega live event coming up this Wednesday. That's Wednesday, February 27th. We're going to be live in New York City. It's going to be me. It's going to be Kurt Hawkins. It's going to be Zack Ryder, Brian Myers, Matthew, whatever his name is. The guys that host the Major Wrestling Figure Podcast, the guy that hosts Not Sam Wrestling, come face-to-face in a live podcast setting for the very first time. It's the war to settle the score, and I've heard these guys have all kinds of surprises up their sleeves. I'm going in to defend myself. There'll be a, a, a retro wrestling figure table there for sale from uh, the guys at the Wrestling Universe. They're coming in to have a whole bunch of old wrestling figures for sale. There's going to be all kinds of surprises. Hawkins and Ryder obviously are going to be there, but they're calling in the big guns. They understand that if they're going to go podcast for podcast against one as big and popular as this one, they're going to need to call all of their friends, and that's what they're doing. The names that I've heard are on the list. And by the way, I haven't heard all the names, but the names that I've heard are on this list are going to wow you. You're going to want to be there in person. Caroline's on Broadway, New York City, 7.30 p.m. this Wednesday, February 27th. Get your tickets at carolines.com. Of course, if you are a Hall of Famer at patreon.com slash notsamwrestling, a Hall of Fame level shill, uh, we'll get you in the front door. I'll send you a message. All you have to do is message me and say, I want to go, and I'll send you back a message and give you all the details this week, okay? But make sure that you're there uh, Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. New York City, carolines.com for all of your tickets. Just go to the schedule, and uh, you'll see my face and Hawkins' face and Ryder's face. You won't be able to miss it. Um, if you notice that I'm sounding a little bit different, it's because the, uh, the, the the regular tones of the Not Sam studio are not in your ears. That's because we're not in the Not Sam studio. Uh, it's been a really busy week. Uh, I went to Houston on Saturday. 
stayed over. Obviously, I did heated conversations with Booker T, which is available via podcast on his podcast feed, and I think they uploaded a bunch of our conversations on video. It was Booker T and Brad Gilmore, obviously. Had a great time in studio on heated conversations. Then, of course, did the uh, Elimination Chamber kickoff show. Another great time where I got to just voice my opinion on everything that I felt was going on, and we can talk more about that maybe a little bit later. Um, I came home for about 22 hours, got right back on a plane. Right now I'm in Tampa, Florida for a a project that Jim Norton and I are working on, which I can tell you guys all about later, a non-wrestling project, but an exciting project nonetheless. And I got here and I I said, well, obviously I'm just going to have to do the wrestling podcast in Tampa. You know, it wouldn't be the first time that I've had to make do with whatever my surroundings are. You remember over the summer? I had a family vacation going through Europe. What did I do? Pack up the microphones, put it in the hotel room. Jess and I together, my wife and I, did the wrestling podcast from the hotel rooms of Europe. Uh, If you remember two years ago when my son was born, there was no excuses. I was staying in the maternity ward of the hospital with Jess. And so what did I do? I brought the microphone. I did a podcast from the maternity ward. Go back. You can see in the archives. I don't miss weeks for anything. Now, unfortunately, yesterday, I'm getting ready to get on the plane. You know, I'm packing up my bag and everything, and I realize that my microphones are nowhere to be found because the last time that I packed them with me, I had brought them to my office at Sirius XM, and I had left them there, so I had no microphones. So I had to get to Best Buy this morning here in Tampa and uh, get a microphone so I could get this thing done course I open the microphone and it's basically in pieces it's one of the you know Yeti microphones but for some reason somebody had just destroyed this box I had no idea I opened up the microphone the base was broken off the tops indented in it's like somebody's had it for 10 years but they haven't I'm just talking into it so I'm holding it right now but the point is we're getting the show done if it sounds any different than usual now you understand why luckily for you this is not a an audiophile show This is a wrestling show where we talk about wrestling, and there's a lot of wrestling to talk about. The whole landscape has changed in the last three days of WWE. You're talking about the NXT call-ups. You're talking about the things that went down at Elimination Chamber. You're talking about Kofi Kingston. You're talking about a lot. Not only that, but we've got another release. We've got uh, uh, Cody Rhodes making some interesting comments. A lot to talk about this week in the state of wrestling, and we'll get to all of it, but before we do... I actually wanted to take you back again. You know, last week we did uh, an interview with Diamond Dallas Page that I did with Jim Norton, and I wanted to share with you guys. Well, Jim and I, uh, a couple days ago, had Sergeant Slaughter on the Sirius XM show. And, I mean, this guy, we had him in for however long we had him in for, and we barely scratched the surface. He's just anything you throw at him. He's got an amazing story to tell about it. I absolutely loved talking to Sergeant Slaughter. I thought it was such a wonderful interview that I said, you know what, you guys who subscribe to Not Sam Wrestling, who who are there every week with me, you guys should not miss this interview. I'm not going to let you miss this interview. I'm going to play this interview for you right now. Sergeant Slaughter, the guest this week on Not Sam Wrestling. You puke. Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, my God. Look. Yes, you were, Bacon. <laughs> Look at the Sarge. He's coming in. He's all decked out in camo. Certainly he's is. got the hat. This is as Sergeant Slaughter as I've ever seen anybody be. Welcome. We were Thank in- you. Good we- to be here. Yes, good to have you, man. We were enjoying your uh, song before. I forgot about the Cobra Clutch. The Cobra Clutch. Do you still do that live? Uh, Yeah. That's a fine yeah. song. <laughs> yeah, did How you? Are you? I'm good. Pleasure. See you. I mean, we, uh, we were listening. You know, and we, you forget that, like, in the 80s, rock and wrestling was a big deal. Right. And you had the best deal out of all of it, because we were listening to your song, The Cobra Clutch. Cobra Clutch. And all you had to do was just say, The Cobra Clutch, the clutch. and yeah. some other schmuck is singing the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And you still got top billing. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote I wrote the song because uh, back then when I first came into the WWE, mm-hmm. uh, it was the WWF and Vince McMahon's father was running it, mm-hmm. and he uh, had me come in for a tryout to do a promo with uh, with Vince, our boss of today, and uh, he said, "Is there anything I can do to help you get ready for your promo?" And I said, "I went to my bag and got this cassette tape out, and I said, could you play this song?'" And he goes, "Well, what is it?'" I said, "It's the Marine Corps hymn," and he said. 
you want me to play that before you go out? And I said, yeah. I think it always, you know, helps uh, get things going. Yeah. He said, well, I never thought about having music before. So he played it, and that was the uh, start of having uh, music for entrances. Like so entrance oh, I, was, I didn't know you started that. I, I wanted to write my own music, so I wrote my own song. And yeah. I'm not a very good singer, so I had to have That's not true. To for You're it. a fine singer. <laughs> yeah. You but like his part, Were you right? in the Marine Corps? You were in the Marine Corps. Yes. Yeah, what yeah. years were you in? Uh, I got out in 74, went in 68. Oh, okay. So you did six years. So did you yeah. go over to uh, Vietnam? Two tours in Vietnam, yeah. Two tours. What did you yeah. do over there? I, I was a basically just uh, infantry, you know, just uh, making sure all the uh, the grunts didn't, uh, you know, eight wall on us and keep them all alive. Were you messed up when you came back? A lot of people were like, you know, it took a while to kind of well, shake that off. we never really talked about it much. Yeah. You know, it was something that uh, we weren't uh, acknowledged as you know, being heroes or anything like that. Yeah. So we never talked about it. There's some lot of bad experiences and did a lot of things I, I normally wouldn't have done or unless I was ordered to do it. Do you, when you see like the way people, like the, the U.S., like you can see people felt bad about that and then like when a Desert Storm happened, they treated the troops properly when right. they came back and right. now there's so much pro-troop the troops. Oh, yeah. sentiment and support. Yeah. Did you resent that at all? Like, well, what about us and... I did for a while, but then, uh, you know, I got you know, with the WWE and we started, you know, working with the military and, and uh, of course we do uh, an event every year, tri tribute to the troops. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's a way of, uh, of me, you know, letting all that hostility and anger out and, and put it toward a, a good, good reason. Uh, yeah. Does it help too getting into wrestling, like not too long after that? and showing up at these buildings and these arenas where you do have adulation. They're cheering for you as a wrestler, but you're yep. still getting right. that adulation that right. you didn't right. get when you should have well, gotten Well, you, know, I, I, you know, I, I did start out as Sergeant Slaughter. I just went as my, myself, you mm -hmm. know, and that was tough because I was, every time that red light went on, I was terrified. I was shy kid, farm kid. And so uh, I brought, I was uh, nicknamed Sergeant Slaughter in the Marine Corps. I never thought about because I was always a hero. Wait, they nicknamed you Sergeant Slaughter in Vietnam? Boy, you must have been yeah. a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should kind of tell you what I did over there. <laughs> but, so anyway, we, it just uh, never thought about using it because I always played the hero. Yeah. And uh, when I, I got done, uh, uh, I forget what I was doing, but I uh, went to the house and I turned on the television and all of a sudden I heard the Marine Corps hymn and there's a movie called the DI with Jack Webb in it. Mm -hmm. And I started watching it and I said, that's a hell of a character for, a, you know, a villain in professional wrestling. And, uh, you know, he didn't use any profanity, you know, maggots, scums, buttes. So I came up with all kinds of different uh, words to use, you know. So uh, it, it uh, panned out pretty well for me. That's like drill instructor language, right? You maggot, yes. you scum. Yeah. But they would use racial language. Too. I don't think they, I don't know if they do anymore. You can't do it. You know, we can't do it, uh, you know, especially on television. But yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, that would be a no-go. No, but I mean, like, back then, they would say anything to you so oh, yeah. in the 60s. Oh, yeah. yeah, there was no uh, holding back, and and uh, it got a little brutal also. It did, right? Yeah. Physically brutal? Uh, yeah. Would, yeah. Did, you, did you, like, uh, Full Metal Jacket, there's that famous scene at the blanket party? Yes. Did, they, did you ever see one of those administered? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you ever it, receive uh, one? Brought back memories. Oh. Uh, I've been in one. You've been in one? Yeah. I've been participating. Wow. Yeah. What did the guy yeah. do? Do you remember? Uh, he, uh... Snuck a uh, Twinkies into the uh, oh, into just the like, <laughs> so it really was. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I, you know, we, they made us do it. <laughs> so you, uh, how long were you out of the military when you got into wrestling? Uh, about uh, six months. Oh, so you went right away. Yeah, you're like, I got to get this energy out of me. What, what can I do well, with this? I was actually on leave and uh, went to a pro wrestling training camp up in Minnesota where I lived. And uh, a friend of mine was a sports writer. We used to always go to the uh, pro, wrestling, pro wrestling matches. And uh, I went there, and I was the only one that didn't have a camera or, or a microphone or a, a notepad. So they asked me to get into the ring. They said, do, do we have a volunteer to get into the ring to make sure everybody thinks this is real and all that? And, mm -hmm. of course, being a DI in the Marines, uh, you knew that volunteer, that was a bad word. That meant you're in trouble. <laughs> so I climbed in there, and they, of course, they made me uh, yell Uncle Sam quite a few times uh -huh. and, and uh, maybe tap out. So I went to get out, and they said, uh, where are you going? I said, well, I don't see any reason to stay in here any longer. Yeah. And uh, you're taking advantage of me. Oh, is that right? Well, you you think you, you do okay on your own? I said, better than I'm doing here, you know, doing what I'm doing. 
So he said, well, get down on all fours. I, I noticed about four or five of the trainees that were going through the camp were kids that wrestled in high school. I beat them all the time. So uh-huh. He uh, got, uh, coach told me to get down on all fours in the wrestling position. And he yelled out, Rick, you get on him first. And Rick, I knew Rick, and I beat him all the time. And he, he was Rick Flair of today. We wow. Grew up, we grew up, you know, uh, in peewee uh, baseball oh. and, and uh, high school. And so I, uh, Rick goes, I got a bad shoulder, coach. <laughs> <laughs> get on him, you know. You guys grew so up I, together. Wow. I pinned Rick, and then they put Capitera on me, and I escaped from him. And, and then it got to be uh, an embarrassment to them. So the uh, other professional wrestler, Billy Robinson, uh, he told me to get down on the fours. And when I did, he dropped his uh, shin on, back to, on the back of my ankle, tried to break my foot, break my ankle. Or yeah, whatever. just to kind of teach you a lesson. Yeah. So I came up, uh, as they say, the mud, the blood, the beer, and got, got him down and, you know, got him. Taught you know, him a lesson? Pretty, yeah, yeah. Wow. And this is your lesson. first day. I mean, yeah, no day. training, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was still in pretty good shape, you know. Yeah. And uh, so the, they finally took me outside, and uh, the, the main coach said, uh, where'd you learn to fight like that? High school wrestling? Yeah. Where'd you go to school? I told him. He said, oh, yeah. What's your name? I told him. And he says, your last name, Reem. I said, your, your father's name, Rudy? I said, yeah. He put the roof on my house. My father was a <laughs> roofer. You know? I said, yeah, I know. He told me, you know. So he says, well, you're. You're uh you're ready for it, but uh you know can't put you with this class. Although you did pretty well, yeah. you're eight weeks ahead of you. And I said, well, I'm still in the Marine Corps. I mean, I can't just you're just on leave. leave. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I went home and told my dad about it, and he said, well, I think you ought to give it some thought. You know, they were farmers and roofers, and they didn't have the money put away for college. So I thought, well, I'll just follow my father's footsteps. I went in the Marine Corps, followed him, went down to PI, and. And I uh, had the opportunity, and uh, when I got out, uh, I didn't re-enlist. I just uh, went right into the training camp and been doing it ever since. You look really good. Like, you know, we, I hadn't seen you in a long time. You look great. I mean, well, you, you really, appreciate that. whatever you do, you fucking look, you look amazing. I went to, I went to have a, a, some minor back surgery about a month ago, and I'm laying on this uh, gurney, and the, this guy comes in. He's, uh, I guess, a nurse's aide or whatever, getting my blood pressure and everything. He keeps looking down at me and he goes, man, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. You look great. And I said, I'm in a damn hospital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my back up and like, what did I do? You're right that I'm laying on a, on a gurney. And he kept coming in. You really look great. You look, and, uh, but it, just, it is pretty amazing. Like, I don't know if it's genetics or what it is because you, I mean, the stuff, even after the Marines, the stuff that you did in wrestling, first of all, you wrestled for a long time, yeah, 45 which is years. terrible for the body, yeah. right? Yeah. And some of the stuff you did even early on, like 1980, 1981, you had a match with Pat Patterson that was like a street fight yeah. that was so brutal. Mm-hmm. Literally, it's like the, the only thing from 1981 that people in 2019 will still bring yeah. up. Yeah, it was called the alley fight. Yeah. And uh, we uh, were put into this match by uh, Vince's father and... Uh, we, you know, got uh, everything ready to, to go there. We built it all up, and they sold out the, not only the garden but the forum. And, and I'm on my way to the. Was the uh, forum watching on closed circuit? Right. Yeah. Wow. Right. The, the overflow. Yeah. And, uh, wow. So, uh, you know, I, th- there was no rules. You could wear whatever you wanted. No time limit. So I, I'm on my way to the ring. I had Ernie Roth uh, as my manager. I call him the general. And I looked at him and I said, uh, Ernie, how does this match end? And he goes, that's a good question. <laughs> I said, there's no time left. There's no referee. There was no referee in the, in, in the, in the match. Yeah, so what, what, how yeah. do you make the decision? So we, we, they, I just was bleeding so bad that they, uh, he ran out and threw a, a towel. Uh, Vince McMahon's father uh-huh. told him he's going to die. He's not giving up. He's not stopping. And uh-huh. I kept crying crawl back into the ring. How long was the match? Uh, it went about 20 minutes. Wow. But it was just, I mean, it was brutality. It was. It was just, a hardcore before hardcore. Yeah, because in 1981, you weren't seeing that stuff. Like, right. You weren't seeing blood everywhere. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the funniest part about it, not that it was that funny, but uh, Vince's father wanted me to go to Japan like a week later uh-huh. on, a, on a big tour. 
and I didn't have a passport, so my wife was flying in from Minnesota to give me my birth certificate so we could go get a passport made. As soon as I hit that uh, top of that ring post, I I felt that burn. You know, you, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I could feel the, the heat of the blood running down my, my face. And the first thing I thought was, how is she going to find me? What <laughs> hospital in New York City will I be, you know, laying in that she can find me? You know? Yeah. Yeah, she, no she, cell phones. She's never been to me yeah. in New York. She's going to jump in a cab and was supposed to meet me at a hotel. Right. And, uh, and you're not, not going back I'm to the hotel. Be at the hotel. <laughs> it's funny. Nobody would have thought at that moment Sergeant yeah. Slaughter is thinking about his wife yeah. flying in with oh, his I'm supposed to meet my wife yeah. after this. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, my wife's going to be mad. <laughs> I looked it down. My hand was on the, on the, on the canvas. And uh, blood was just like pouring on my hand, and it was splashing. And I, that's all I thought about: is how is she going to find me? Did and you guys realize after that? Did you guys go, "We just did something that people are going to talk about for a long time"? Or did you go, "That was that was Tuesday"? Moving on to the next day. When I when I saw the towel come in, I was really disappointed. I didn't want it to stop. I wanted to keep going. Whether how we were going to stop it, I didn't know. But it was a brilliant idea. Whoever thought came up with it, Vince's father, I guess. But uh, you could hear the, the roar. People, uh, it made Sergeant Slaughter, that tough-ass yeah. Marine that everybody right. knew was a tough son of a bitch. You know, he, he, uh, he didn't stop. He didn't want to give up, and they threw the towel. He didn't throw the towel in. Somebody else threw the towel in for him. But from that point on, I was like a god. It was like, you were uh, made. You can't. Nobody can beat the Sarge. I mean. Was there, a, when they asked you to burn a flag, you didn't want to do it? No. And uh, was it with that? Was did they okay with you saying no, or was that a battle back and forth? Well, what happened was I just won the title from uh, Ultimate Warrior at the uh, the Ultimate Puke, I should say, at the, uh, <laughs> the Ultimate right. Puke right. yeah. <laughs> at the uh, uh, Royal Rumble in Miami, uh, Florida. And uh, after we won the title, we had to do a lot of promos and new promos because everything changed. All the cards had to be changed, and all the and I was uh, having, I was a champion, and he was the challenger. So, we so were... this, by the way, I mean, just to set it up a little bit, this was a a ballsy move because you come back. This is now ten years removed right. from what we just talked about. Right. You come back. Right. You're uh, a bad guy. Right. You're an Iraqi sympathizer. Right. Yes. Yeah. At a time when the U.S. had a conflict with Iraq. Right. But if I'm not mistaken, the night that you won the title and said we're going to go forward with this was the same night that the U.S. announced this isn't. This isn't just a, a conflict. Right. We're at war. Right. And now, and that's a much bigger deal. Right. Now you as a bad guy right. wrestler right. are supporting the opposing force right. yeah. in a war. In a you know, war. Kinda, just kind of kind of uh, fit right in there, you know? Yeah. Made it even worse for me. Yeah, know? I'm sure it did. Because we, were, you were, as I was saying, we were doing new promos, and uh, Gene Oakland got arrested, so he uh, was doing promos, and he had a uh, earpiece in. And all of a sudden, he's doing a promo, and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't believe what I'm hearing in my ear set. Sergeant Slaughter's behind the Miami arena burning the American flag. And and I, I'm sitting, <laughs> what, what did he just say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm burying the American flag. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So I, I hear it. He does it again. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I, I walked right in front of cameras. I went, cut, cut, cut. Because it was, you know, oh, wasn't live. Oh, yes. Yeah. And and uh, Vince comes running out. What's wrong? What's wrong? I said, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not burning any American flag. What are you talking about? I'm sitting right here. Yeah. He goes, Oh, we're just saying that you did. I said, No, we're not even saying I did. Mm -hmm. I'm not. That's the one. Yeah. That, the one that's thing. the line. That's going too far. That's the line. You're going to lose your sponsors. You're going to lose your television. You're going to yeah. lose the brilliance. You Plus, might... you were over. You had, I'm sure, friends that were killed. You oh, know, yeah. in fight. Sure, it, it just sure. it, it went there beyond people that were there that night. I mean, uh, probably uh, were there just uh, by luck that they didn't get killed somewhere. You know. How difficult was that for you? So you go from about January because Royal Rumble's in January. WrestleMania's in April. By the way. April's coming up. WrestleMania 35 will be here at MetLife Stadium, and tickets yep. are on sale for that. But this is Ticketmaster at Ticketmaster. Yeah, this is WrestleMania seven though, and you go from January to April more or less, supporting Iraq and every all the bad guy promos are about how right. you're going to beat Hulk Hogan, and and right. you're supporting Iraq and um, Hulk Hogan supporting America, right? And you're sitting there getting death threats, oh. right? 
I mean, Bomber. people aren't looking at this yeah. like, oh, bad guy wrestling, right. bad guy promos. Right. They're like, you are right. a legitimate traitor. Right. It wasn't sports entertainment yet. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it was war. Right. It was war. And right. so you'd go out and people would really hate, really hated you. Oh, hate, hated me. Did you have to wear a bulletproof vest? Did you say that? I did. I did yeah, not say that. I, I, yeah. I did. Yep. I, uh, I had just gotten out of G.I. Joe. I went for six years with G.I. Joe and left the WWE for the first uh, WrestleMania. I wasn't there. And I... I believe it was supposed to be Hogan and I in the main event. Of WrestleMania so, 1? Yeah, number one. So I made this deal with uh, with Hasbro, and I thought Vince would be happy about it, but he wasn't. He said, I just signed with LJN, and that's a conflict of interest. So, I see. So, so it wasn't necessary because the G.I. Joe cartoon was wrapped up in the toy. Right. The right. Sergeant Slaughter G.I. Joe toy was what you right, signed right, for. Right. And now he's saying this is a conflict yeah. to my business. Yeah. So I see. He, he, you know. We'll get back to the Sarge momentarily, I promise you. But first, I want to tell you about SeatGeek. You know, Sergeant Slaughter was talking about how they wanted to put 100,000 people into a stadium so that they could watch Hulk Hogan take on Sergeant Slaughter. And can you imagine how difficult it would have been to get tickets way back in 1990? It's not that much easier nowadays. You know why? Because it's so complicated to figure out how to get tickets online. It makes no sense. There's hundreds of sites, varying levels. Levels of reliability, you never know exactly who to trust. And that, my friends, is why SeatGeek is the way to go. SeatGeek puts millions of tickets into one place so you can easily find the seats that you want at a price you're willing to pay. Look, Every purchase is fully guaranteed. You can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to source for everything. They've got sports, concerts, comedy shows, Broadway, whatever you want. Of course, wrestling. You want to go see All In or, or whatever the new All In show is called? Double or nothing? SeatGeek has your back. You want to come out to New York and go to WrestleMania? SeatGeek has your back. You want to go to just a local concert that's in your town? SeatGeek has your back. I've got the app on my phone. It's so easy to use. All you do is you can put in your location or the act that you want to see or whatever it is, any descriptive. They're going to find the event. You're going to click on it. Seating chart pops up, show you what seats are available, what the value of those seats are. Every metric that you need will be right there. Best of all, you guys are going to get $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase just for listening to this show. All you need to do is download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code SAM today. That's promo code SAM for $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets back to Sergeant Slaughter. Uh, being uh, the great leader he is, he figured I'd say, okay, let's go You know, let's go to WrestleMania and well, LJN and all that. But I said, well, you can only be a G.I. Joe once in your life yeah. as far as... A real life, you know, out of the uh, G.I. Joe uh, cartoons and animated and and action figures. I was the first living one, you know, and mm -hmm. that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, for sure. It is today. Yeah. It's, uh, so uh, I declined. I, I said, I'm, I'm going. And he, and he wasn't too happy about that. So Do you regret it? Uh, no. No, I don't regret it. I, I, I miss those uh, being those first six WrestleManias. But uh, in, in the long run, I'm, I'm glad I did it. And uh, that's when I came back. How long was he upset I, for, Vince? Like, what, did did that strain your relationship to the point that there were years that went by that he's yeah, like, I don't want spoke anything? spoke to each other. I didn't even watch WWE. I, this I, is bad. I was, yeah. yeah. I, I worked for a couple of independents, started that for all the independents of today. Mm -hmm. And I was making actually more money in the independent leagues than I was in WWE. But, well, because you were G.I. Joe at yeah, this point, yeah, too. You're a much yeah, bigger celebrity. And by getting, far the biggest name. I was all over the place. Yeah. You know, over Japan and everywhere promoting G.I. Joe. And so when the contract came up, uh, Vince uh, calls me. I was watching a NASCAR race one afternoon, kind of nodding off a little bit. And the phone rings. Hello, uh, Sarge? Yep. Vince. Oh, hey, Vince. You know, there's only one Vince. Yeah. But you hadn't spoken yeah. to him in years. No. At this point. So he said, uh, I had sent him a, a little note, hand handwritten note about WrestleMania 6. I said, that's the greatest. Uh, and I wasn't crazy about the match, Hogan and Warrior, the ultimate puke and puke mania. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, puke. I said, uh, but the uh, production, unbelievable. Uh -huh. I said, uh, the cameras and all, I gave him the whole thing. So he mentioned that right away. He said, I got your note. 
appreciate that. I never got that type of thing. It's always usually, uh, it was a great match, great show, but I never heard about the you production know, value, production end of it. So he says, uh, I hear your contract's up with G.I. Joe Hasbro. I said, it's funny you should know that, you know. <laughs> yeah. He goes, you ready to go back to work? I said, yeah, I am. So he, he said, come on over to my house tomorrow morning. I got an idea for you. So I tell my wife uh, and my daughters that night, I'm going to Vince McMahon's house. We're going to make G.I. Joe the real, 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 real American hero, and, you know. And Vince is smart enough to know that <laughs> yeah. if I'm asking G.I. Joe to be an Iraqi yeah. sympathizer, right. this is right. an in-person yeah, conversation. Yeah. We won't do yeah. this over the phone. <laughs> this is on yeah. the phone. Yeah. <laughs> so I get to his house, go to the library. He's got this thing all laid out of the uh, L.A. Coliseum, 104,000 seat wow. capacity. Uh, big screens all over the place. He says, I want you and Hogan to sell this out. And uh, so that's great, but how are you going to make uh, Hogan a villain? He goes, Hogan? <laughs> no, I'm not making Hogan a villain. I'm going to make you a villain. I said, well, how are you? What, what's your idea? He said, well, you know, they're, Saddam Hussein, you know, overtake a Kuwait, and you're not happy with the country, and letting a little uh, country like Iraq and uh, General Saddam take over the world, and and uh, America's weak, and you know, blah blah blah. So, so it's, it's so it's it's sort of, and that's a that's a very Vince McMahon thing. Like it's very sort of detail oriented in the sense very. that he's not saying because I like Iraq better than right, the U.S. Right, it's right. a it's a bad guy. It's a villain saying right. no. I like the U.S. so much that I'm disgusted, right. and we need to be more like. Iraq. What's going that, on in Iraq? And plus, he's looking at 104,000. Sure. Right. <laughs> now, how did he convince you? Did you did you like the idea immediately? Were you like, ah, oh, this sucks? Or, or do you like, this uh, is great? Did you go from G.I. Joe like to, like, it. Saddam Hussein yeah. knows, knows what I was kind of flab fabric uh, flabbergasted. And I, I just uh, kind of st stood back and I thought about it. And uh, my funnest time in, in professional wrestling, uh, sports entertainment, was, was being a villain. So mm -hmm. now here we got, you know, I'm going to be a... Uh, you know, Iraqi sympathizer. And, and he goes, now go talk to your family about it. Cause it could be pretty rough. And I said, okay. And of course on the way home, I, I said, this is what I want to do. And I, next morning breakfast, guess what that Dad, dad's going to be on Iraqi. <laughs> 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 and no more GI Joe. And, and my wife goes, you're crazy. You can't do that. Yeah. You can get killed. Yeah. I said, well, let's see what happens. She says, okay, you're the, you're the guy that runs the uh, table here. So, uh, we went after it, and uh, Vince just said, I'll, I'll let you go, and if you get too far over the line, I'll, I'll pull you back. Yeah. So he let me do Whose idea was it to wear the, to uh, the headdress? You I wore the headdress. I, I wore the uniform. I got a, a gentleman by, from uh, Minnesota who was a manager there. His name was uh, Billy White Wolf. He was an Indian wrestler, but he was from Iraq. Mm -hmm. Went to college with Saddam Hussein, knew wow. the language, had to escape you know, the country, uh, and uh, he looked exactly like Saddam Hussein. You're talking about the dreaded General Adnan. Yeah, General yes. Adnan. He really yeah. did. So Sergeant Slaughter starts coming to the ring, like yeah. with an Iraqi flag and everything, yeah. Yeah. and his manager yeah. looks like a body double right. of Saddam Hussein. Yeah. yeah, when he first came in to show Vince and I, the, uh, it was in Hershey, Pennsylvania, he shows us his outfit, and he's got a little handgun on the side of his and I said, oh, whoa, 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 no weapons, no weapons. He said, oh, it's just a plastic. I said, I don't care what it is. You're not wearing that to the ring. And don't right. give anybody any uh, right. ideas. And Vince says, yeah, you're right, you're right. So so anyway, we went on this uh, rampage and uh, just uh, tore everything apart. I, I would do, uh, when it's Saddam's birthday, I'd go to a bakery and get a cake and I'd <laughs> get some candles and I'd, I'd uh, have everybody stand up and sing happy birthday to Saddam because they would do it. And then uh, there was the times when I was, uh, I would say, uh, what, I want you all to stand up and give 10 seconds of silence to the brave Iraqi soldiers who <laughs> died in the, in the uh, overtake of Kuwait because today's Veterans Day in Iraq. Oh. Uh, people wanted to, they were coming over the railings and I'd always time it so my opponent's music would hit and, and they would be satisfied that this guy would beat the hell out of me for a few minutes. Now, is part of this just your confidence in the ability to handle yourself? Because yeah. there yeah. is, like, you do have to exist outside yeah. the arena. Sure. Oh, yeah. And these yeah. people are not separating, like, oh, right. that's not, Sergeant Slaughter right. is just a wrestling right. character. Right. Like, that's not happening. Yeah, they hated no. you. Yeah. Well, the, it happened the first night on the title after the uh, flag burning thing, and they didn't air it. We went to, uh, I went with my agent, uh, and we went to a Denny's, I think it was, and there's nobody in there. It's three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. No no service. Finally I 
I asked the girl, I said, could you get us some service? And she kind of shook her head. She ran into the kitchen. Here comes this burly guy out of the kitchen. He's got a spatula and a little uh, naval cap on and white T-shirt, walks over the uh, table, and he's got the spatula in his hand. And he looks at my agent, and he goes, you can eat. He's not. And he points the spatula at me, pulls up the sleeve of his uh, T-shirt, and he's got the uh, United States Marine Corps emblem tattooed on his arm. So I looked at my agent. I said, I think we probably should go somewhere else to eat, you know. Yeah, so, but uh, you didn't break and tell him, no, look, this is just the whole yeah, thing. You no, just No, I, I went with it. And so you never Philadelphia did you, and, did you uh, did you get to spots where you were you want to just tell the world like, no, I'm I have this military history. I'm acting. I'm doing. No, no, I only did that at my daughter's school. I went up there a few times. I'm a I'm a Cub Scout leader, you know. Oh my God! Uh, <laughs> and, uh, the Cub Scout yeah. leader is waving yeah. the Iraqi yeah. flag on television. Yeah. So I had to go up to schools and and tell them I'm just you know an actor. I'm their father. I, this is just a character I portray, and it didn't really help. But you know, my oldest daughter didn't care, and uh, she you know went with everything. And my youngest daughter was a fighter. She'd stand and fight for me and she'd come home sometimes with a black tire. Oh, they'd give her you know, shit. You know, she, she was, but she'd fight back. She fought back. She, Did you ever have a physical... You call my father that, you know. Yeah. Did you ever yeah. have a physical problem with somebody out? Oh, uh, not not too much. You know, we, uh, I got to Philadelphia next day after I won the title from the Ultimate Puke and, and we, <laughs> uh, and I got there and Jay Strombo was the uh, road agent and he said, have you talked to your wife today? And I said, no, is there something wrong? He said, no, I don't believe so. If you talked to Vince, and I said no, and uh, he said, "Well, you might want to give him a call." We didn't have cell phones, so I find a pay phone. I call my wife. There's just a machine, and I leave a message. And then I call Vince, and he'd just gotten back from Miami. He's in the office, and he said, "Yeah, yeah have you talked to your wife?" And no, spoken to your wife. No. Uh, is there a problem? No. Uh, somebody called the wrestling office this morning and said they're going to kill you. They're going to kill your family. They're going to kill me, kill my family, blow up our houses, blow up the wrestling office, the studio, mm-hmm. our cars. And I thought I'd take a precaution and call your wife, tell her to get the hell out of the house, you know, just in case. You know, we don't know. Yeah. So, uh, and I finally got a hold of my wife, and of course she said, "I told you this wasn't a good idea." <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, we kept on going, and and I finally got home about four days later, and, and uh, I lived in Connecticut, Western Connecticut, and I had this house that was hard to find. I, I loved the the uh, road because it was dirt, and it didn't even have a road sign. Mm-hmm. And when you finally got to my driveway, it was a big windy thing up the. You could hardly get a car up there. That's convenient when you're going on TV as a former military sure. man sympathizing yeah. with the Iraqis. Yeah. Be hard that's to super, find. Yeah, so, that's super uh, convenient. So I got to the top of the, the hill, and there's a Winnebago. I don't know how it got up there. And four gentlemen come walking over out of a, a black sedan, sedan, and they opened up their uh, coats and showed me they were packing weapons and told me they were going to walk the perimeter of my property, the four acres, 24-7, until they were told not to. Going to take my children to school. And, wow. And Did Vince hire them? Or the who, 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 who got that done? What's that? Who got that done? Did you? Vince. Oh, he did. Vince McMahon, yeah. Wow. So uh, he, um, they said, so we're told not to. So I walk in the house, of course. My wife's got the rolling pin in her hand and <laughs> another spatula I got to look at. And uh, so she said, I told you this wasn't a good idea. And I said, I know. She said, I'm not going to the grocery store with a armed guard <laughs> and my children aren't going to have an armed guard at the schools. I said, I know, I know. So I told the guys. Isn't that great? After all this, yeah. like, you know, your, 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 your whole life and then everything you're doing, you're getting everybody pissed off. You're ready to blah, blah, blah. And you get home and your wife, I know, I know. I yeah. Know. Honey, yeah. You're right. I got it. You're right, honey. honey. Yes, honey. Yes, honey. Uh, where's the garbage? You want me to take the garbage? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, we, we went on along with it, and uh, finally one night in Madison Square Garden, uh, Vince's father was still, you know, around, and and uh, he said, "There's some gentlemen that would like to talk to you. I want to do this little room," and uh, they were the FBI, and they said, uh, "We get so many. Uh, we don't know if you know this, but we get so many death threats and problems with you that we were wondering if you would consider wearing a bulletproof vest." Wow. We have, we have this new style that is mesh. You, you won't even know you've got it on, but we think we should take a precaution. Like just in your day-to-day life? Right. Wow. Yeah. And, and you just, said yes. Just basically wrestling, they said. Oh, for when you go out to the ring and <laughs> right. stuff. So right. you, in case you get shot. I in the, see. Did yeah. it scare you? No. What? 
It didn't. No, I, I just didn't want to wear it. You know, I, I've, been, I've had bulletproof vests on, you know, for most of my uh, military career. And, yeah. and uh, they were bulky, but these were pretty nice. So I, I wore it for about a month. Mm-hmm. And then I just I quit wearing it. And they would have to take me on an airplane uh, without any other talent, superstars. And I would always uh, walk down the plane. I wouldn't go through the terminal. And they'd have a car and an escort take me to the hotel or to the arenas. And but it was worth the investment it was, because the sure. payoff was going to be so big. Yeah, It was yeah. such a big thing. How many years did that happen for? And, uh, that, we did that uh we did it up, up till the the war really escalated and they were losing lives. Oh, okay. And Vince and I just sat down and said, "Let's let's end it. Last for my country back, because people were losing their lives." And, and uh, yeah, you did it for yeah. about eight months, right? Oh, I yeah, mean, it kind of ended in and we summer of that. Our year. way to uh, WrestleMania, and uh, the worst part about it was that we we got there and and they told Vince you got to secure the Coliseum. Mm-hmm. It's going to be about three, four million dollars, and mm-hmm. he said, "I'm not doing that." So we ended up going, you know, into the uh, eighteen thousand seat. Uh, uh, so you, didn't do, you couldn't do one hundred and four thousand after yeah, all that. That was the heartbreak of it all. Yeah, because all it would have been too much that, money to secure all, it. Yeah, all that. And, now, and, uh, people say too, like I mean, and in hindsight, people say that part of it was that business was not as good as you guys thought it might be because people were legitimately offended and didn't want to be. A part of it? Did you think was that part of it, or not oh, no, really? We we did the biggest pay per view and had had that record for many years. I see. Till it was broken, of course. But yeah, uh, no, we. So there was that interest yeah. in seeing you finally right. get your ass kicked. Yeah. yeah. Well, the fun part about it is, uh, uh, we we go to the match and they have all you know uh, Regis Philbin as a special ring announcer and. And Alex Trebek is a timekeeper, and Willie Nelson's going to sing you know, "God Bless America," and Donald Trump is in the front row with Marla, and and uh, all these people that I know, you know, uh, they wouldn't even talk to me. <laughs> wow, <laughs> they they were into it so much that they they sorry you, you and um, I'll never forget Regis just walked over to me and you're bad, you're bad, Sergeant Slaughter. You know, he just started berating me and. How'd you finally break it? How'd you finally go, all right, we've, we're done with this because people are really getting killed over there. So how, how'd yeah, you finally break and it? Did, and did you worry to... that you would never be able to be a good guy ever I, again? I, well, Vince told me from the from the beginning, he said, your uh, your fans will always love you and they'll always bring you back. That's, That's just a lot of faith. Is. Yeah, a lot of faith in you, especially from that match we talked about, the alley fight. Pat Patterson he said, they, You'll never lose them. You know, you always have them. I don't care if you're 80 years old and a pot belly and you can't walk. They're going to cheer for you because you entertain them and you showed them you're a tough son of a bitch. Uh-huh. So uh, we decided to do the uh, let's go for the country back idea. Went to all the monuments all over the country. And one night in um, some town in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Bean Jean out doing a promo. Vince says, go out and, and do a uh, I want my country back promo for me. And we didn't have scripts or anything. Mm. And we were all ad lib back then. So I go out there and I start trying to talk and want my country back. People are booing and grounding me out. So finally I took the microphone and I start, started singing God Bless America. And uh, got kind of teary, teary voice. And I was actually uh, sad, you know. And uh, people st- stood up with their lighters and sang the song with me. and applauded and gave me a standing ovation i walked back and go through the curtain and vince is just shaking his head i can't believe that you did that in that that short a time that you got those people back he turned them and yeah he, he said you teamed up with hacksaw against uh, the iron Sheik and nikolai volkov in the next hour why don't we turn on hacksaw because <laughs> he saw he saw the love and he wanted you to go back. They were doing all over again. Turn on and I said, okay. And he goes, no, no, no. no. I just so, and then we went, well, uh, went our own other way. How did you, uh, so after WrestleMania, you, when you start going into the summer and just get to the tail end of this, you know, evil Sergeant Slaughter thing, you added a man named... Uh, uh, Colonel Mustafa, Mustafa was the Iron to Sheik. your yeah to your yeah. regime, and that was actually the Iron Sheik. Yeah, yeah. what was it like uh, partnering up with the Iron Sheik? We've met the Iron yes. Sheik before. Yeah, I, I never was a, a a fan of that idea. I yeah, I uh-huh. really didn't want somebody coming in, but Vince wanted to 
did him some work. I guess he must have owed some money or whatever, and and felt felt sorry for him. Wanted to give him some work. And the knees. If you go back and watch those matches, the knees aren't what they used to be no, on the Sheik. He no, can't actually no. take bumps. Right. Like he can't really do anything because you can see him kind of walking on right. like some kind of fake knees. Right. You know what right. I mean. So yeah. he's not uh, he's not in the best shape in no, the world. No. And so we you know we we started this uh, triangle of terror. You know. General Adnan, Colonel Mustafa, Sergeant Slaughter. And uh, we got to where we got, went to a summer slam at Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. Match made in heaven, match made in hell. Macho Man married Miss Elizabeth the same night. So uh, I'm getting ready to dip my outfit on, and here comes Vince. Takes me into the shower. I got a little problem. I said, what? He goes, Warriors holding me up. I said, what do you mean? He wants 500000 cash before he wrestles or he's not wrestling. So That's Warrior it. comes to Vince right. and goes, I'm not going out there unless you give me 500000 right. right now. And what's cash? Cash. Jesus. Cash. So I said, well, what are we going to do? He goes, well, I'm going to pay him. But he's finished. He's fired. You know, but get, let's do the match. You know? So I said, okay. So there's the uh, Mustafa. And I said, okay, I'm going to throw a Warrior out on the floor. You jump down and break his leg for him. And Vince goes, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, I don't need a lawsuit on it. On top of else. So but we, Sheik would have done it. We had the match. and Sheik yeah. would have broken the leg, though, if nobody had stopped him. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So he got this 500000 in cash. Was he fired right after that? Yeah. And yeah. did he ever come back? Oh, yeah. He never Everybody really comes came back. back uh, full, full board, but yeah, they, I, I'm, I was really shocked that he got in the Hall of Fame myself. But, uh, you know, uh, he's there. and, and uh, you know, that's the way the business is. Do you dislike him? No, uh, no. I never disliked him. I always uh, had great matches with him. We made money together. He was kind of ACDC a few times, you know. He'd be on planes with him, and he'd be in a really foul mood or or whatever. But uh, down deep, he was really a, a nice, kind guy and, and worked hard and did whatever he had to do, you know. Get the business done. And I mean, the story is that he got fired literally immediately after the match, right? Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Well, Vince said, that that's not the worst part. I said, what could be worse? He goes, he wants to be introduced first. <laughs> <laughs> he wants the first pop. And I said, you're kidding me. And that's what really bugged Vince. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the, the worst part about it. So anyway, uh, we, I finally had my last match with uh, the ultimate uh, warrior in uh, Orlando. And it was a cage match. Mm-hmm. And uh, in our business, you know, a lot of times you connect when, you know, not really wanting to hurt somebody, but sometimes you really do. And every night it was like that with Ultimate Warrior, the puke, you know, he, he would uh, give you a clothesline and you'd see stars. You know? <laughs> and so on uh, the last match, I stopped at this uh, market and uh, I get this piece of vegetable and General Adnan says, what are you doing with that? And I said, you'll see. So we have our match, and about, the, about five minutes into the match, he hits me with a clothesline, and I had this potato in my my uh, outfit, mm-hmm. and I threw it up in the air, and it started bouncing all around. And in our business, if you hurt somebody, it's called a potato. <laughs> <laughs> so it's bouncing all around the ring, big Idaho potato. You know? <laughs> and he stops in his tracks, and he's looking at it. And he's looking up, cage, <laughs> cage on top of the, you know, cage. So that, how did it get in here? And then he looked down at me, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm moving my body in a laugh. And he grabs that potato and tries to stuff it in my mouth. And, <laughs> he and, uh, was, was laughing. I never heard him laugh before. And uh, so when he got inducted into the Hall of Fame, the night of WrestleMania, I tried to find him, and I because I stopped. Uh, before the uh, the show, and I got another potato, <laughs> and I was gonna give it to him as a gift, mm-hmm. and uh, I could find him, could find him. Finally, I went by a room, and there he's doing a promo, and I and he and he stopped doing the promo and goes, Sergeant Slaughter, and I held up the potato, and he came running at me, you son, of a... <laughs> and started talking about it, and did the promo, and it was a lot of fun. What was That's your relationship amazing. like with Andre? Andre was good. Good. He lived in Ellerby, uh, North Carolina. I live in North Carolina right now, but I used to live there a lot more. And uh, he would always have a little party once in a while, and he had this house that was made for him. 
giant's house. His gazebo was probably the size of most people's homes. You know? <laughs> All the doorways were 15 you know, feet high, and he had a like a double king put together, and chairs were made for him. And, and uh, if Andre liked you, you were fine. If he didn't like you, it was a pretty rough night. And they said so, he didn't like John Studd. He hated John Studd. <laughs> hated John, and, and John Studd was uh, terrified. He was. He was terrified of him. I, I Once in a while, I... Uh, have John in my car, we'd be traveling. And he talked about it, I almost get tears in his eyes. He said, I don't know why he doesn't like me. <laughs> I said, because you're trying to slam him, you know, he doesn't want to be slammed. So, uh, and they're like, oh, no, the, it's just a, it's, it's a business. We're yeah. just, we're just all working yeah. together. He's yeah. like, no, nope, doesn't yeah. want to. No, not Andre. <laughs> but he would, but he would try to, I think he said he would try to put a hurting on him when he, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and Andre, if he was in a good mood, you're fine. Right. You know, one night I got him and he'd been on the road, come back from Japan, little town in New Jersey. People were coming out of the woodworks and uh, I come uh, to the to the uh, arena and Andre's not there yet. His plane's late. Finally, uh, the rep, uh, one of the guys said, just go out. He's on his way. Go rile up the people. When, they, when he's here, I'll send the referee. Okay. So here comes the uh, referee. He looks at me. <laughs> You're in for a good time. I said, oh, no. what do you mean? So Andre just got off the plane, and and he's in a great mood, you know. So here he comes, and uh, I, I get him in the ring, and he used to kind of play around with me. And so I, I got him in a front face lock, and he's got this hair he, like a lion, you know. And I I get him in his front face lock, and, of course, we, we put some pressure on it pretty heavy a lot of times just to to kid around with, with some of the guys we like. And uh, so I tell the referee, lift his, tell him, ask him if he wants to give up, you know, give up to the Sarge. <laughs> so the uh, referee p picks up his paw and he drops it down and and uh, there's no, no movement. So he lifts it up again. I said, ask him if he wants to give up. And down goes the paw again. And all of a sudden I looked at the referee and I said something. To myself, something's not right, and all of a sudden, it was, <laughs> <laughs> Andre, Andre fell asleep. He was so so you, tired from the trip that he he fell asleep. He fell asleep. In this you didn't choke him out. Now I'm gonna. Now I'm trying to wake him up. Because, uh, <laughs> we've only been in the match five minutes. You know? So I'm hitting him on the back, and finally he wakes up, and now he's mad at me. So he starts well, chasing you woke me. him up. <laughs> oh yeah, like a grizzly bear. <laughs> And uh, I, I started running around the ring, and he's coming after me. I jumped over the, the top rope. He'd come over the top, run around. Finally, I headed back to the dressing room. Yeah. He just left. Yeah. I ran around the, the locker room, uh, the lockers, and he's chasing me around. <laughs> and I said, what do I do? Arnie Scolan was the uh, road agent back then. And he said, I, I don't know, kid. He's got a cigar. I don't know, kid. <laughs> yeah. So I, I saw the, the kid, Private uh, Daniels, who used to write uh, – drive my uh, camouflage limo. I said, get the car ready. He, he said, uh, the car? I said, get the car ready. So I run around, run around. Andre still follow me. I see the exit door. I hit the exit door and at perfect time and there's my camouflage limo. The back door is open. I fly into it and off we go and I look back and there's Andre. That's uh, so funny. Next day, uh, he got, got a hold of me, but... <laughs> he did get a hold that of you the next day. Fun night, <laughs> fun stories. So he he was quite a drinker right here too. Did you, did you ever go drinking with him? Oh yeah, yeah. He he could put him down. Yeah, they said he would fucking really pound uh, pound beer. Well, I mean, his hand was yeah. the, bigger than a beer can was. Yeah. yeah, he would. He didn't drink out of a glass. So he just drank the bottle of wine. You know. Right. Let me. Yeah, I'm gonna have a couple of wines. Like that a, means two bottles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was a great guy. Good, good man. When you uh, uh, later on. You were back in the WWE again as like a commissioner type. After you were done wrestling, you were just the authority figure there. Right. And, you know, when you would talk and you would do these promos and whatnot, sometimes when you would be animated, you would spit a little bit when you oh, spoke, yeah. right? You know, that <laughs> yeah, would happen. I'm spitting on your microphone. Right? <laughs> he really did. He left a hawker. So <laughs> they did this bit where Sergeant Slaughter is talking to Triple H and Shawn Michaels, who were young guys at the time, and they interrupt sergeant talking they just say hang on one second and they put on these glass helmets like uh, masks that have windshield wipers <laughs> in. Yeah. yeah and they go okay go ahead and they turn their windshield yeah. wipers yeah. on while he's talking yeah. how do you not break and go like 
that's the funniest shit I've ever seen in my life. How do well, I how do I stay mad at this? It, it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen because I didn't know what was happening. Yeah, you know, they had a we had scheduled to have this promo, uh -huh. and uh, they tell you how much time you've got when you go out there, and and uh, so I I get into the ring, and I'm I'm the uh, commissioner, as you said. And I'm like the, uh, the sheriff at the OK Corral with no laws, you know. No, mm -hmm. I didn't have, I couldn't tell anybody to do anything really because they wouldn't listen to me anyway. Right. So <laughs> here's, uh, you know, Degeneration X and Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and, and uh, China. And so uh, there's this paper bag, like you said. In, in, uh, and they didn't the tell way. you in advance they, what was in the bag? They didn't know a thing about it. It's helpful. <laughs> so I start, you know, berating them and telling them what's going on, and this is the way we do it, you know. And Commissioner Slaughter said so. And uh, so all of a sudden they said, hold on, sir. Just like you said, hold on, hold on. And they reached in his bag. He's got these, like, plastic welding helmets with a clear face and they pushed a the button and the damn windshield wiper started going. <laughs> well, I, it took everything I had not to burst out <laughs> yeah. and laugh, you know. And uh, it, it's probably one of the most classic uh, promo things that ever took place. And But we we just, we just, would try to do those things. To of each course. Other. We try to have fun and, you know, try to make each other laugh, especially live television. I mean, yeah, there's no fixing it, you know. It's like when you're watching Saturday Night Live and all of a sudden a, an actor starts laughing. It starts breaking, you know yeah. it's coming up or or something surprises them and they, they just go out of character. It's just, it was yeah. fun. By the way, you'll be able to uh, meet the Sarge yourself. Uh, uh, he'll be part of WrestleMania Access here in New York. It's going down April 4th through April 8th. It's going to be Sergeant Slaughter and all the other WWE superstars, past, present, everybody will be there. It's at the Brooklyn, it's at Brooklyn Pier 12 in Brooklyn, New York. It's, New York. it's April 4th through April 8th, so you get your tickets, you get uh, pick your session or whatever. That's on Ticketmaster, as are tickets for WrestleMania 35, which is going down Sunday, April 7th at MetLife Stadium. Right. It's a whole week long of uh, oh, celebration yeah. and fun, and uh, the uh, WrestleMania access is just a, a great time. You meet, like you said, you meet the uh, the superstars of today and the legends, and get uh, photos with them, autographs. Uh, even, they used to have a thing where you could announce a match mm -hmm. you know, with somebody that uh, does that, like a Michael Cole. And sure. I'm not sure if they still do those types of things, but they have a lot of interactive fan experiences. Uh, as you said, uh, memorabilia and uh, the biggest uh, display of uh, WWE memorabilia in one room or one. Under one roof. Yeah, it's amazing. You've I seen can't it. wait to see. You it. were there a couple years ago so the, when I we were in wait Orlando. To see yeah. what's all on there. You know, yeah, it's just, it, it surprises me every time I I see everything that's uh, being uh, sold and and uh, available for the uh, WWE universe to. You know, you had a, you had, you had a rivalry with Jim Norton's favorite wrestler of all time. Well, I was a Bob Backlund fan at one Bob point. Bob Backlund. Fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bob and I. Uh, I. Uh, you ever see him do the knee the, walk? Uh, he was doing the uh, the what? The knee walk? Oh yeah. yeah you like he, the knee walks? Yes, he was doing yeah. he was doing the uh, <laughs> uh, step test, uh, Harvard step test that we used to do in the Marine Corps, and so he said he was going to do it for an hour, and it was going on all the while the matches were going on in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. What's the step test? Just walk up and down. Yeah, the... you up and down one step, uh, then you go up with the other foot, and you just go back and forth. For you know, he goes for an hour or two hours. You know, it just uh, never stops, and uh, it's in a, a a certain position. You have to do it in a, in a upright position. Oh. And uh, so he uh, about fifty five minutes or fifty two minutes into it, I decide he's not doing it right. So I go out and uh, I start berating him, and he's still doing the test and. Finally, I do something to distract him because he's going for a record mm -hmm. uh, of amount of time to, to do this. And uh, so I get him mixed up, and he has to stop. So he gets mad at me. He jumps in the ring after me, and I started uh, beating him with my uh, riding crop, That's my right. swagger stick. And I welted the back, his back, like uh, no tomorrow. <laughs> you whipping Bob Backlund? That's right. I you remember? remember? Oh, I certainly yeah. do. I was actually thinking of that as you're talking. I remember the step, and I remember you whipping Bob Backlund. Yeah, yeah. And when he, uh, yeah. when he got his uh, Hall of Fame acceptance <laughs> uh, speech, he uh, walks over, 
up behind the podium, walks over where I am, and he goes, and you, Sergeant Slaughter, I still hate you. <laughs> my daughter hates you. My <laughs> wife hates you. All my family and neighbors hate you. But we had a hell of a match. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this Sarge, was great. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, man. Don't yep. forget, WrestleMania access at, the Brook at Brooklyn Pier 12, April 4th through April 8th. WrestleMania 35 is April 7th. They're doing the Hall of Fame. There's everything going on. Ticketmaster for all your tickets uh, to the whole weekend. I'm sure Jim and I will be doing a whole bunch of stuff associated yeah. well, with we're it. Gonna, so. You know, we're going to be at the uh, Barclays Center also for uh, Raw. Absolutely. And uh, NXT TakeOver uh, Hall of Fame will be there. Yep, and SmackDown. The, uh, and the SmackDown Live. Yeah. It's all going to be at the Barclays Center. I can't wait. I can't yep. wait. It's my favorite weekend of the year. Thank you, Sergeant. Yep. Thank you. Underscore Sergeant Slaughter. No push-ups for you guys. <laughs> You're dismissed. By under, the way. Underscore is, SGT Slaughter on Twitter. Is, is Jim Norton, as many times as you've brought up maggots, is Jim Norton the human being that most resembles what a real maggot might look like? I think he would look good in a Cobra Clutch. I do, too. I do, think too. think we ought to put him in one? I think so. I think. Oh, that'd be, a, that'd be a fun it. picture. <laughs> yeah, let's do Hold it. On. Yeah. So the Sarge is going to put Jim Norton in the Cobra Clutch. Did you stand oh. further away? There used, be, there used to be a move called uh, the sleeper hold. Right, right. So the sleeper like hold gets locked on. Uh, Jim, I like that Jim prepares to go to sleep. Yes, it does. Yeah. So the Cobra Clutch was invented to work on both this side and that side. Okay. Jim, tell me if you can feel kind of that it would like be effective. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> well, I, even, I haven't even put it on yet. Yeah, you yeah. have. That's, that's the Cobra Clutch. Oh, you can how, do, how does it feel when it gets a little tighter? Clutch, it feels very unpleasant. <laughs> yes, I am. Slime. Indeed. The, the vein in your forehead Dumb. is popping. Yes, he's choking me. <laughs> <laughs> he's a strong son of a bitch. <laughs> is Sergeant Slaughter still quite strong? <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. Those giant marine hands. Here is Sam Roberts. One of the greats, Sergeant Slaughter. Such a pleasure talking to him. Of course, that will be up on video on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash NotSam. If you want to watch it first, become a NotSam show at patreon.com slash NotSamWrestling. But so many gems in there. So many gems. And the fact that at this point in his life, he's still happy. He's still got gratitude for everything. I mean, you talk about not being afraid of heat. That's what people talk about sometimes. The reason why some bad guy characters don't work is some guys are afraid of heat. Sergeant Slaughter fought in Vietnam and was so unafraid of heat, he was willing to go on television and portray a sympathizer to Saddam Hussein and Iraq while we were at war with them. Some people say or, or think that he should have been a lot more afraid of the heat. That he shouldn't have done any of that to begin with. You know, I'm somebody who I've said a million times here on the podcast, I think you can get away with just about anything in wrestling because you can portray it in the context of he's a villain, he's a bad guy. You know, I think that if you were to have a movie where a character in the movie were a sympathizer to an enemy that we're at war with, you know, I'm, there are people who have played members of Al-Qaeda in films. Actors have played members of Al-Qaeda in film. Actors have played Kim Jong-un and Hitler and all terrible people. But we don't look at those actors and go, well, you can't portray that character because it's too real. It hits a little too close to home, you know? And I think that sometimes, as much as wrestling is a beast into and of itself, sometimes that's the way to look at wrestling too, that even if we're drawing from reality, we're still telling stories here. And, and these are still performers that are telling the stories. I think if you do it right, you can get away with just about anything in wrestling. But maybe that's just me. I'm interested in, uh, in what you guys all think. Um, speaking of getting heat, of course, there were some people that were, again, upset about things that I was saying on the uh, Elimination Chamber kickoff show. I wasn't even sure I was going to be on the kickoff show until the last minute. But look, once again, I go in and WWE says... Just go out there and give your opinion, you know? I don't have any apolo I certainly, if I'm not going to apologize about what I said about Bianca Belair, I certainly don't have any apologies to make this time. And honestly, a lot of the opinions that I was giving on the kickoff show, I've kind of said the same stuff here on the podcast. So I, I'm, I, I try to be, the one thing I try to avoid is being hypocritical. The one thing, I, I don't want to be fake out there. Okay, I, I, I want to be... Give an analysis. Give my opinion on what's going on. And 
you know, if WWE is going to ask me to give my opinion, I've gotten to the place where that's what I want to give. That's what I want to give them. Not just sell the pay-per-view, sell the pay-per-view, but sometimes you've got to give your opinion, and that's what I did, and I'm glad so many of you tuned in for it. I thought it was, it was, it, it was a blast, and it always is a blast. I thought Elimination Chamber was a great pay-per-view, and for everybody that said Royal Rumble was way too long, well, you got Elimination Chamber done in about three and a half hours. Isn't it funny that we've gotten to a place in 2019 when there's a three and a half hour pay-per-view, and we're like, that's it? Where's the rest? That's it? We're done at 10.30? Well, we started at 7, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought that the length was perfectly appropriate. When you have a pay-per-view like that, you got two big Elimination Chamber matches in it that are going to take up some time. You're telling stories with the other matches. Three, three and a half hours is right on the money. You know, I think with the big shows, WrestleMania, Royal Rumble shows like that, four, four and a half hours right on the money. But anything more than that gets to be a lot, and I thought and maybe that's why Elimination Chamber felt good. I thought all the matches counted. All the matches told a story, and and the length was right. But we'll get into a full review of Elimination Chamber because it also opened us up to stuff that we saw both on Raw but mainly on SmackDown. It really feels like these last two pay-per-views, as of right now, going into WrestleMania, have been a lot more about SmackDown than they have been about Raw. But we'll get into that all uh, in the state of wrestling this week. Uh, I'm excited to do it. As a matter of fact, I'm so excited. I don't see why not start it now. Don't forget, by the way, I should mention again, this Wednesday at Caroline's, get your tickets if you haven't already, carolines.com, the major wrestling figure podcast versus Not Sam Wrestling. Whole bunch of surprises, whole bunch of people coming out. People are going to be talking about this show for a long, long time. You're not going to want to miss it. I'm going to embarrass the major brothers. Carolines.com for tickets. Let's get in to the state of wrestling. It's now time for this week's State of Wrestling. Welcome into the State of Wrestling from the hotel room in Tampa, Florida, where we're going to break down the top five stories of the week, according to yours truly, in the world of professional wrestling. So, we'll start with story number five, and I don't even know if this is so much of a story. It's just a tweet that I wrote down after I saw it, because it really struck me as pretty perfect. I, I, I loved it when I saw it, and it was something that I wanted to talk about here on the show today. It was a tweet from Cody Rhodes. Earlier this week, or a week, whatever it was, somebody tweeted Cody Rhodes, and they said, are you going to be at the Madison Square Garden show uh, WrestleMania weekend, asking if he was going to be a part of the New Japan Ring of Honor uh, show going on at the Garden? Now, I think that that's an important question, and you can see, apparently, I haven't checked myself, but from what I've read, the aftermarket ticket sales are not so over the top for this Ring of Honor New Japan Madison Square Garden show, even though it's sold out, and I think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that, look, it's going to be a great show. There's a ton of great talent in Ring of Honor. There's still a ton of great talent in New Japan, but I think a lot of people bought tickets thinking that they were going to see Kenny Omega. Cody, the Young Bucks, Adam Page, maybe even Chris Jericho. And we know now, apparently, none of those people are going to be anywhere near Madison Square Garden. And this was confirmed by Cody Rhodes' tweet. They asked him, are you going to be at Madison Square Garden? He responded, no, sir, that's WWE's weekend. I think that this is great. This leaves all elite wrestling I mean, this cements them before even going on the air, before even announcing a TV deal, before even technically, unless you want to count All In as their first pay-per-view, which I say that you do not, because if anything, All In is simply the pay-per-view that led to the formation of this promotion. So this promotion has not yet had its first pay-per-view, and it has already taken the stance as the number two, at least, promotion in the world because... Unlike every other wrestling promotion, it is not piggybacking on what WWE is doing. It is not looking at WrestleMania and saying, oh, there's all these wrestling fans in town. WWE is that big of a draw. Why don't I run my show as well? AEW, in that one statement, Cody is saying that AEW is is making the conscious choice to not follow suit with what everybody else is doing and to not be a part of this weekend 
when it's not about them. To all, and, and he's doing it in a in a in a I don't want to say a polite way, but in a way of to say, look, let WWE have its weekend. You know, we're not going to have WWE running around for for all uh, for not all in for. Um, I was going to say one more round, but that's not what the show is called. I'm just having a brain fart at the moment for. Um, Oh, it's going to come to me in just a second. We're not going to have double or nothing. WWE is not, not piggybacking double or nothing. So we're not piggybacking WrestleMania. It puts them in this position of great power, I think. And it's what I was talking about a lot with the press conference, about differentiating themselves, about making the AEW product something that is truly the alternative. And I don't think you can be the alternative if you're following... WWE and there's no way you can work that weekend and claim that you're not following WWE or if you're working WrestleMania weekend whether it's good or bad you know I'm not making a judgment on on it I'm just saying if you're working WrestleMania weekend you're following WWE's lead you're trying to grab an audience WWE has created if you're deciding not to do anything WrestleMania weekend and instead to book a weekend in May to go to Las Vegas and create your own event, well then, you're truly doing something that is alternative to WWE. Now, it would appear that StarCast, which is attached to AEW, and I know that uh, Conrad makes it a point to say StarCast is not an AEW event, and it's not, but it would be like if... Michael Cole, I mean, when we turn on AEW press conferences, Conrad is the first face that we see. He's the master of ceremony of these things. So if Michael Cole announced, I'm doing a wrestling fan fest, I'm taking over Access, but it's not WWE Access, it's just called Access. And it has, and everybody associated with WWE is giving it their stamp of approval, and everybody associated with WrestleMania is going to be there. It becomes a very, very difficult thing to separate the two. Clearly, StarCast exists because of AEW and is a complement to AEW. Even if they're two totally separate businesses, you know, they are associated. The Undertaker. And this is part of, you know, story number five is also The Undertaker, because we didn't really talk about him last week, is going to be at StarCast, which is huge. Now, you know, he has done a couple of things before. He's done some Comic Cons recently. He's, of course, done some WWE Access appearances in the past, but he's never done a non-WWE wrestling show before for any reason, whether it's to do an interview or sit in the crowd or do an autograph signing or a match or whatever it is. He's never done any wrestling thing without the WWE stamp on it. And we talked last week about how he had removed the WWE branding from his Twitter account. And I said that I think that that really has everything to do with him trying to just get out there and do more signings and and open up new sources of, of revenue that are not necessarily WWE associated. It's his way of letting all the independent uh, autograph signing promoters out there know that he's available, that it's not go through WWE and I'll come to do do a signing wherever you're doing signings. It's come to me because I'm the guy who's in charge of what my destiny is at this point. Now, it is a shock that he would turn around and do StarCast right away, and it certainly does, even if he's not going to step foot in the MGM Grand and be a part of uh, Double or Nothing, and I don't think The Undertaker will be a part of Double or Nothing, but just the fact that he's part of StarCast does add a huge amount of credibility to AEW. Even if it's not their event, it adds a huge amount of credibility to that weekend. Jonathan Coachman is going to be there too doing a signing at the StarCast. So um, I'm interested to see, because at the last StarCast before All In, There was really nobody that was associated with WWE at that show. So I'm very interested to see what this starts to look like. I'm very interested to see if other people who have similar deals, you know, I suppose Jonathan Coachman must have an announcer's deal. I don't know what his deal is. I guess I should have asked him on Sunday privately, but I don't know what his deal is. But, you know, we've seen, for instance, 
I think uh, uh, Caleb Braxton, Renee Young, Charlie Caruso, Cody, uh, not Cody Rhodes, um, Corey Graves, all of them have done appearances outside of WWE. They do appearances at stores. They do appearances at wrestling conventions. Who knows? Jonathan Coachman's popping up at StarCast. Maybe one of them pops up at StarCast. Who knows? But I think it's really opening up the world, and uh, I'm interested to see how WWE handles AEW and StarCast. You know, because it's not... Every time anything good happens for AEW, people start to say, Vince McMahon's panicking, Vince McMahon's panicking. Maybe he is panicking. Maybe everybody's just going off the ranch and acting independently. Or maybe Vince McMahon is as aware as we are that competition is good, and maybe he's loosening the reins a little bit. Maybe he's saying, look, if it's not in your deal, like the active roster superstars, if you're if it's in your deal that your personal appearances come through us, well then no, you can't do StarCast. But if contractually you're allowed to do StarCast, go ahead and do StarCast. You know, if that's the attitude that's being taken, there's got to be something behind it. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, but that's my story number five. Story number four is Ty Dillinger. Speaking of AEW, and and that's obviously the first three letters that come up whenever any superstar asks for their release. Uh, We talked about Hideo Itami last week, this week, uh, just actually right after SmackDown. It was on Twitter, Ty Dillinger. He did a screenshot uh, of a couple pages of notes on his phone explaining that he had asked for his release on Tuesday from WWE. Now, WWE has not confirmed that they've granted him his release, but he said he asked for his release and then kind of gave a goodbye and spoke as if he was not going to be wrestling for WWE anymore. I would imagine that if he were not at least verbally granted his release, he wouldn't have gone and announced it on Twitter, but I don't know him well enough to say whether or not he would have done that. I would just think that a person wouldn't. Um... I think he is, I mean, in the, in the right position to be doing something like that. Clearly, Ty Dillinger had built a little bit of buzz up for himself in NXT. You know, I was a Ty Dillinger fan, the Perfect 10. He was a heel, and I think, you know, something like the Perfect 10, you should be a heel. But, you know, he, he built up a buzz for himself in NXT, He did that one Royal Rumble where he came in as number 10 while he was still in NXT and got a huge ovation for it. When he first got to WWE, when he first, first, first got to the main roster, there was this introduction that he's the perfect 10, but it was pretty clear from the beginning that it just wasn't, there was just some disconnect between Ty Dillinger and the main roster. And that's not Ty Dillinger's fault. That's not anybody's fault. It's just, you can just see that whoever makes the decisions did not see in Ty Dillinger what some fans saw in Ty Dillinger. He has been pretty dormant. He has had injuries. He's also not had injuries. Either way, he's been pretty dormant over the last, I don't know, year or more. He's just not part of the conversation. So, you know, I I think you come to a choice. You know, Ty Dillinger is at an age where he goes, look, I could stay with WWE, make enough money, you know, support myself, support my family, start a family, if I, whatever it is. Like, he's, he's, I'm sure he's making decent money and, and be this guy who just, okay, I'll work for WWE. I'll, I'll be in the dark matches, or I'll be in the main event matches, or I won't be used, whatever it is. My dream from when I'm a kid is to be in the WWE. I can live very, very comfortably. I'll just be in WWE, and hopefully, as I end my career in the ring, maybe I can do some stuff outside the ring. And I don't think that that's such a bad choice. You know, it's one of those things where you go, what's this fight about? You know, what do I want out of this thing? Now, if what you want out of this thing is for your work to be appreciated at the highest level possible, if you're going out there and going like, look, I have a lot left in me to give to wrestling and I can't get it out there if I'm not being used or if I'm losing after a two-minute match or whatever it is, I can't do what it is I think I have to offer pro wrestling, 
well, if that's the case, then by God, I think you have to leave. You know, you truly have to take destiny into your own hands. Uh, I think Ty has some work to do. You know, I think he's got some work to do on the independence to remind everybody what the buzz was for him when he was in NXT. And anytime something like this happens, they talk about, you know, the way NXT superstars are treated on the main roster. I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't think that, that you can put a blanket statement over the way NXT superstars are treated on the main roster. Because let's be honest, the guy who's going to WrestleMania to main event against Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship, who may very well beat Brock Lesnar, is a former NXT champion. So NXT is becoming this developmental, beyond a developmental territory, it's becoming the place where everybody on the roster goes. And for the most part, they have. I mean, you know, look at that elimination chamber on 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 Sunday. The only reason a bunch of guys like Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, Jeff Hardy, AJ Styles, well, AJ Styles is the exception to the rule, but the rest of them, Kofi Kingston even, it's because they've been on the main roster for a very, very long time. You know, you start going down and, and you know, I guess Mustafa Ali technically went straight to 205 Live, but, you know, you look at, at anybody. You look at Roman Reigns. Dean Ambrose was technically in NXT. You know, every, everybody, Kevin Owens, who's a, who's the only former who's, who's a former Universal Champion, the only one who held it for a significant amount of time, NXT. Um, Finn Balor, Intercontinental Champion, NXT. I don't think it's fair to make a blanket statement that people get treated poorly after coming from NXT every time. Because if that were the case, there would simply be no successes. And clearly there are some. That said, at the same time, everybody who comes from NXT can't be in the main event. And this goes on to actually story number three this week, which were the new NXT call-ups. I think there is still some confusion. We saw Ricochet, Aleister Black, Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano. And they all came up and they worked both Raw and SmackDown. And there is some confusion about, is this the uh, introduction of these guys on the main roster? Is this their debut? Are they done with NXT? Now, clearly, Gargano and Ciampa are, at the moment, title holders. I don't want to spoil anything for NXT, but at the moment, they are title holders. I think that odds are Ciampa will go in to take over New York as the NXT champion still. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, that that transition isn't happening right now. And it's very, very possible that all four of those guys kind of do double duty between now and WrestleMania. And then after WrestleMania is when they're, when they're saying goodbye to NXT. And where does that leave NXT? You know, you look at it and that would mean that in a very short period of time, NXT has lost Lars Sullivan, although the world apparently has lost Lars Sullivan. So you got Lars Sullivan, you've got Lacey, you've got EC3, you've now got Nikki Cross, all of Sanity's gone, including Nikki Cross. Um, you've got Heavy Machinery, gone. And then the new four, Ricochet, Gargano, Ciampa, Alistair Black. And those four guys are four of your main event guys. You are looking at a couple of things. Number one, in NXT specifically, you've now opened up for a lot of opportunity. You've now opened up for Matt Riddle to really start to uh, um, rocket towards the main event. You've now opened up the opportunity. Who is not on that list? Who is really strangely missing from that list? The answer is the Undisputed Era. Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish, and Roddy Strong are not in the discussion for the main roster call-ups. Now, clearly, I think that what happened was... Uh, Sunday, uh, 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 halftime heat was a huge success. And, you know, I don't know that Vince McMahon is watching NXT. Maybe he saw Sunday, uh, halftime heat for the first time and said, you know, look at the response these guys are getting. Bring these guys up too. And they said, well, let's leave Velveteen and, and the Undisputed behind. And he said, okay, because that's, that's who you're looking at. Velveteen Dream has 
the opportunity to now go from having match of the night to being Mr. NXT. And the Undisputed Era, the reason I bring them up, is because this opens the door for 2019 to be the year that the Undisputed Era takes over NXT, which is what a group like that should be doing. You know, I love the idea of Matt Riddle and Adam Cole being the future of NXT and Matt Riddle having to come from behind, having to deal with all four members of the Undisputed Era. That's what I would do. Put the NXT Championship on Adam Cole. You know, maybe put it on on Matt Riddle for a moment. For a moment. Only to lose it right away to the Undisputed Era's Adam Cole with the help of the rest of the guys. And then have Matt Riddle chasing Adam Cole for that NXT Championship. I mean, that to me is what the future of NXT looks like in the short term. Um, And I think it's a good thing. You know, I think all those guys leaving... Because really, when you've got Gargano, Champa, when you've got Gargano and Champa on that card, and we started to see it on Takeover, you run into a huge problem where there is no place to go for Gargano and Champa but the main event. There is nothing for them to do in NXT after the 2018 that they had. After that story was told, there is simply no place for them to go in that company because that story was bigger than the whole brand. There's it, all you can do now is move them up to the main roster and see what happens. Now, when you talk about that story, I do think that this main roster move has forced us to rush the Ciampa Gargano story. It would seem like the original plan was probably an NXT for the second wave of this story to be DIY reforming, but under the sort of black heart mentality of the current day Tommaso Ciampa that sort of uh, um, bringing Gargano in trusting Ciampa again becoming friends with Ciampa again that story it seems like has been completely rushed because it's time to get them on the main roster and we want to put them together on the main roster the other thing is and this is a little detail but it bugged me why in the promo photos of Tommaso Ciampa, when they introduced him on Raw, when they said he's coming up next, the whole thing, he's smiling. Why? And not like a maniacal smile, but like a I'm a friendly, good guy smile. But he's got the big beard. He's got the... the like he's still the bad guy that we've been watching for the last year. But he's smiling. I didn't love it. But again, I think that that's because the reality is when these guys get to the main roster, they can't rest on the laurels of what they did in NXT. The story that was told in NXT is not the story being told on the main roster. So we almost have to leave that behind, it would seem like. Um, In terms of the way the main roster reacts, I think that it's good news for the NXT guys, as I said. But I think the reality is, especially with Roman Reigns gone, that the WWE, in real life, not in storyline, in real life, the WWE is looking for guys to step up. Whatever that means, they are looking for guys to step up. Sometimes at work. I mean, think about the WWE like any other place of work. Sometimes at work, you get comfortable in your job. Friendly with the boss, you know what the job is, you do you you do a good job, but you come in, you punch your ticket, you do a good job, you go home. You're not sitting there at some point when you're young at times, you go and you're and you're just scrapping and scrapping and scrapping, trying to get that promotion, trying to get that raise, trying to get from part time to full time, whatever you're doing. But at some point, you get to a place where you're comfortable. Maybe you don't think that there's any place else for you to go in terms of lateral uh, movement. And so you go, okay, I'm just going to come in and I'm going to do a good job and this is what my job's going to be. This is what my life's going to be like. And then somebody comes in and a new employee comes in and they are as experienced as you are, but they are showing the hunger that you did when you were young. And that's because they're new to this company that you're in, right? And you start looking at them 
and going, wait a minute, this person's trying to outshine me. And whether that means that a promotion that I didn't think was going to happen for me will now happen for this new guy, or they're going to try to get promoted and take my job from me, or they're just going to gain favor with the boss that I could really use, or whatever it is. There's a certain degree of discomfort and a certain degree of uncertainty that if you inject into a group, into your employees, can make them work harder and can make them work better. It would not shock me when I saw, especially the level of NXT star that were brought up, the fact that that they brought the four top guys in NXT. I don't think you could argue that. The four top guys in NXT were brought up to the main roster. I think that that was for us. That was for the fans in terms of giving us something new. But I also think that they're trying to shake up that locker room. Now, I didn't know any of this was going to happen. Nobody was. I was there on Sunday. Nobody was talking about it. It was a surprise. It was a total shock to me when it happened on Raw. So I don't. I have no inside information. But I wouldn't be shocked if they're trying to shake up the locker room a little bit and say, look, we need guys to start stepping up. And if you're not going to do it, maybe some of these NXT guys will. Because now you're sitting there going, because there are fans that are like, hey, Aleister Black should be in the main event. Tommaso Ciampa should be in the main event. Gargano should be in the main event. Ricochet should be in the main event. And you're right. Right? You're right. Look at how great they all are. But guess what? There's only one main event. And if you put any of those guys in the main event, you're taking out somebody who's established and been on the main roster for years. So now... There's this struggle to see who's going to be the guy, who's going to be the person in the main event. I think coming off of Raw and SmackDown, for me, it was close as to who looked best. I don't think, I, I wouldn't even say looked worst. I think everybody from NXT, all four guys, ended up looking awesome. Personally, I think Ricochet looked the best. I think Ricochet was introduced as this is going to be your new underdog babyface hero that all the kids come to see, that all the girls like, that does stuff that's so spectacular, the dudes like him too. Like, this is the next good guy hero. That's how I think Ricochet was shown off. Um, After that, it's tough, you know. Maybe just because... He was shown off as a single star, while Gargano and Ciampa were shown off as tag team stars. I feel like Aleister Black is probably second, and then Gargano and Ciampa third. But I would be, I would love to have a conversation. In fact, maybe I should. Maybe we should do a bonus podcast or something. I need to find somebody to talk to about that, because that's really intriguing to me. I think, but I could be, I could absolutely be swayed. I think that Monday and Tuesday were best for Ricochet, then Aleister Black, then Gargano and Ciampa. I think they were great for every, I think it was great for all four of the guys, but I think that that's the order that I would put it in. Um, and honestly, it made me excited about what these guys would look like on the main roster. Um, I th- started getting goosebumps with Aleister Black, to tell you the truth. I think Aleister Black has this, and I don't like to compare people, you know, you know, I don't like the. Becky Lynch, Stone Cold Steve Austin comparisons because I think it actually takes away from Becky Lynch. But seeing Aleister Black, who is this complete character, right? He is a total character. But at the same time, I don't see the difference between the real guy and the character, right? I see this character being portrayed but I also see it as reality. I, as a fan, can believe that Aleister Black is Aleister Black when he leaves the building. When he goes home, he stays Aleister Black, that there is only one Aleister Black, and that's the guy that we're looking at. And the, and the last person that I felt that way with that was that much of a character as well, an over-the-top character that feels grounded in reality, was The Undertaker. Now, again... That whole darkness thing obviously adds to it and adds to the comparison. But I love like I love the idea that you can describe who Aleister Black is. Aleister Black is a man that exists 
in the line between good and evil. I get it. I look. He. He's got one kick pad that's all glossy and one kick pad that's matte. He's got the black and white on the black of his on the back of his vest. He is a human juxtaposition. And I love that character. You know, everybody that we saw, there's no one like those guys, right? We see Ricochet. There is nobody that's like Ricochet on the main roster right now. Alistair Black, there's no one. No one like Alistair Black. And when we see Gargano and Ciampa as a tag team, in those two matches, both of those two matches brought the tag team division up to a whole nother level. And I think WWE could really use that. There was some criticism about the Revival taking the L to Gargano and Ciampa, but I don't think that that's a... I, I think that that's not a fair criticism. You know, I think that it's okay that they took the L because they weren't prepared to wrestle Gargano and Ciampa. You know, Gargano and Ciampa have been waiting for this opportunity all their lives, whereas the Revival haven't thought about Gar Gar Gargano and Ciampa since leaving NXT. So... You know, and the tag titles weren't on the line, so it's not like you're doing switch, 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 switch. But what it does do is it opens up a conversation now when Gargano and Ciampa are officially on the main roster. Well, they are within reason to say, hey, we want a pay-per-view tag team championship match with the Revival. And then you've got a tag title match that you're as excited about as some of the singles titles. And it could be really, really good. But I, I, I like the way it's handled. I, there are people who criticize it, as I said earlier, that say it should be special when these NXT guys show up. They should show up and be like, oh, my God, EC3 is here. Oh, my God, Johnny Gargano is here. Oh, my God. But you have to understand, the entire roster is coming from NXT now. It's not like every now and then we'll have one guy coming up. If we want to have long-term main eventers, you can't let everybody who comes from NXT get the main event treatment as soon as they walk in because you'll have a different main eventer every three weeks. There's too many guys. You know, of course, you'd want to see Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa and Ricochet and Aleister Black and EC3 and Lars Sullivan. You want to see all these guys come in and be main eventers. But like I said earlier, you've only got the one main event. Uh, let's move on to story number two here this week in the state of wrestling, and that is the Elimination Chamber. And I don't want to go through the entire Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. We all saw it. It was a really good pay-per-view. Uh, everything counted, you know. Uh, I'm interested to see where they're going with the Women's Tag Team Championships. They haven't made an official announcement about how exactly they're going to be defended, except Bailey and Sasha Banks said that they'd go to any show. They go to NXT UK, NXT, Raw, SmackDown, wherever. They'll defend those titles wherever. Now, I think that the WWE has to start taking it seriously and have to start working towards defining those tag titles. It was enough that we had this moment where the first women's tag team champions were crowned. Now, we have to make those titles count for something. Because the idea is... That theoretically, one of the reasons why these women want these tag titles is because, you know, you've kind of, you're starting to shape your WrestleMania main events. You've got theoretically at this point, Charlotte versus Ronda until that changes. Asuka will presumably defend the SmackDown ta uh, uh, Women's ta Championship. But beyond that, the women aren't guaranteed any more matches on this show. Theoretically, the Women's Tag Team Championship will need to get defended if it's a championship that is to be taken seriously. So what you're doing is you're welcoming whoever wins those titles to a match at WrestleMania to defend those titles. It's a big deal. You know, I just think that now, and, and in short order, because now those titles are in play, we need to start feeling like those titles are in play. I want, I want you know, all the women who competed in that elimination chamber to start calling out Sasha and Bailey. You know, if that elimination chamber was such a big deal, then those titles should be extremely difficult to keep 
for Sasha and Bailey. So we'll see if that happens, but uh, I do think that that needs to be taken seriously. The other chamber match, uh, how about the rise of Kofi Kingston, huh? Clearly, this was not in the plans. You know, it couldn't have been because Mustafa Ali was supposed to be in this match. But, and I said it on the kickoff show, it says worlds about Kofi Kingston. Everybody's been so excited for Mustafa Ali. I'm one of them. But the fact is that as bummed out as we all were the SmackDown before Elimination Chamber when it was announced that Mustafa Ali would not be competing, by the end of that gauntlet match, Kofi Kingston made us all forget about it. Kofi Kingston made us all want to see Kofi be the winner. And then we felt it even more at the chamber itself. And that final showdown between Daniel Bryan and Kofi Kingston, it was probably, and I I don't even think I need to say probably, it was the best elimination chamber match of all time. And a lot of that had to do with what happened at the end of that match between Daniel Bryan and Kofi Kingston. The work Daniel Bryan is doing right now in the ring and out of the ring is the best work of his career. This is the best we've ever seen Daniel Bryan in WWE, in my opinion. I'm, I'm, I love that they're going to spend three weeks now building towards a Kofi-Daniel Bryan match because all it does is make Kofi feel like a more and more serious contender for the WWE Championship. Kofi Mania was what a lot of people were tweeting about because they want to see Kofi Kingston get the WrestleMania match. Look, I think the Kofi Kingston thing is so new. I'll tell you how I feel after Fastlane. But right now, I wouldn't mind a Kofi Kingston WrestleMania match. Look, is it so hard to believe... What what if, you know, and this is crazy. So at the Royal Rumble, my guy Hot Dog, my young boy Hot Dog, he said, I think Kofi Kingston's going to win the Royal Rumble and go to WrestleMania. And I was like, Hot Dog, this is why you wouldn't be anywhere near a booking table. That makes no sense. I love Kofi Kingston. What you just said makes no sense. He will not let me forget that I told him that was stupid because now it's the match people want to see. If it were up to me, I would probably have Kofi Kingston lose at Fastlane again, maybe due to Eric Rowan interference, but make it a great match that it, we really feel like Kofi might win this one and then say, you know what, we're going to have to bring it to WrestleMania. And maybe, just maybe, what if, what if Kofi Kingston were to win the WWE Championship at WrestleMania? Now, I've heard some people uh, I don't remember where I read it, but I've heard some people say, like, wouldn't it be great if there was a big E heel turn and it cost Kofi Kingston the WWE Championship at WrestleMania? I don't think so. I think that the journey that we've been on with the New Day, I think for the New Day to be able to evolve to the point where one of their members can be WWE Champion and it doesn't mean that they separate would be uncharted territory. Big E turning heel would be cool, but it would be a heel turn like we've seen heel turns before. To be able to celebrate with Kofi Kingston and watch as the New Day are in the ring, hoisting Kofi Kingston, Kofi Kingston on their shoulders, prom- presenting him as the new WWE champion, I mean, I think that that would be a moment... If you play it the right way, you could make that moment a parallel to the WrestleMania 30 Daniel Bryan moment. I mean, that could go down. The New Day hoisting Kofi Kingston up as the new WWE champion could go down as one of the great WrestleMania moments of all time. I'm not against it at all. And I think as each day passes and as each opportunity as Kofi Kingston gets, it only gets that scenario only gets more and more desirable and the fact that you've got ronda versus becky versus charlotte versus whoever whatever you've got with ronda rousey you've got that you've got seth versus brock lesnar so what you've really got is the opportunity to take a chance you've got the opportunity to take a chance with kofi winning the championship from daniel bryan at wrestlemania if you're not going to take it now you're never going to take it This is the time. You want to present fans with a new product? Put that title on Kofi Kingston at WrestleMania. Screw him at Fastlane. 
give him his moment at WrestleMania. I think it would be unmatched, personally. We'll move on to story number one. Speaking of unmatched and WrestleMania moments, a lot of moments happened for this group, but one of the biggest is going down at WrestleMania this year. It's D-Generation X, the first inductees to the 2019 class of the WWE Hall of Fame. You know, I think this is a genius way of getting China into the Hall of Fame. And really, the, I mean, the best way for her. You know, I think that China will forever be associated with D-Generation X, and rightfully so. I think it gives the opportunity for Road Dog and Billy Gunn to shine, you know, to allow them to have the spotlight. And, I mean, putting Shawn Michaels into the uh, two-time Hall of Fame club with Ric Flair I think is beyond appropriate. You know, I don't think we'll see Triple H go in as a solo member of the WWE Hall of Fame for a long time because, you know, it would feel weird. He's kind of the guy in charge. But this gives him the opportunity to have a moment for himself. And really who I'm happy for is X-Pac. I mean, the the appreciation for X-Pac's legacy over the last five to ten years has made me so happy. It really does show that you never know how things are going to pan out, right? Because, you know, towards the end of X-Pac's WWE run, people just booed him for the sake of booing him. Like, it wasn't, they, they didn't even take him seriously anymore. But once he was gone, and a few years went by, and then he started kind of telling his stories, X-Pac is one of the smartest wrestling guys I've ever had a conversation with. You know, he loves wrestling eats sleeps breathes gave his life for it the whole deal and you know i i think he's going to be around wrestling forever if anybody deserves to be in the hall of fame i mean he was a cruiserweight before cruiserweights were cruiserweights he transitioned into into the nwo he transitioned into dx he was a part of so many influential movements and quite frankly he was really the first guy on a big scale to act as a role model for smaller dudes. When I was growing up, man, if I watched the NBA, it was Muggsy Bogues. If I watched WWE, it was the one, two, three kid or six Pac or X Pac. You know, I'm really happy. And, and he's just the nicest guy in the world. He deserves it. I'm really happy that X Pac's going to be going in. So one of the questions that came up was who's going to induct Degeneration X. If you've got, show, oh, and the other question was, well, Billy Gunn's already been announced as being a, a producer for All Elite Wrestling. Do you think he's not going to be on stage? I would guarantee you that Billy Gunn will absolutely be on stage for this moment. Um, and again, you know, that goes back to the theory of how does Vince really feel about All Elite Wrestling? How does he really feel about it? Eh, it's interesting. It's really interesting. That's another uh, long-form conversation I'd like to have with somebody. But the question is, who inducts D-Generation X into the Hall of Fame? Right now, I think my pick, right, because you'll have, obviously China won't be on stage with them, but they'll all be representing China. You'll have Billy Gunn, Road Dog, X-Pac, Shawn Michaels, and Triple H all on stage. So who inducts DX? You know, we heard from Sergeant Slaughter this week. He was a big rival of DX at one point. Vince McMahon, you know, the latter DX, he was a big rival of theirs, although I don't think that he would uh, allow them to choose him even if they wanted to, and I don't think that they would. I think, because really the DX, to me, and maybe it just depends on when you grow up, but I feel like the... You know, the, the, the Triple H, Shawn Michaels, China version of DX was the foundation for this group. And maybe the most important part, I mean, the most important part of the house is the foundation. But the house, the house is what we remember. And the house of D-Generation X is what was called the DX Army. The house is the group of guys that drove up to declare war on WCW. The house of D-Generation X is Triple H, X-Pac, Road Dog, Billy Gunn, and China. There was one guy that was with, and there were other people associated with DX. Of course, Kane was one of them, maybe Kane. But to me, 
I think it should be Mick Foley. You know, DX and, and Mankind for a period of time were pretty closely associated. When you look at those photos of Mankind holding up the WWE Championship for the very first time, D it's DX whose shoulders that he's perched upon. That moment that I described with the New Day and Kofi, Mankind had that with DX. I, I have Mick Foley, who was always an ally to D-Generation X. I have Mick Foley as the guy to put them into the Hall of Fame. I'd love to hear what you think. You send me an email, notsamwrestling at gmail.com. Tweet me, whatever. Let's keep the conversation going because that's one of the things that I love to do is talk about who should induct this person, who should induct that person. We'll find out who else is going in as the weeks progress, but let me know what you think. I think it should be Mankind, Mick Foley, putting DX into the Hall of Fame in Brooklyn, New York this year. That's it for the State of Wrestling. Don't forget to join us Wednesday, February 27th at Caroline's. Caroline's.com for tickets. It's me. It's Kurt Hawkins. It's Zack Ryder. And it's a whole bunch of ridiculousness and surprises. It's going to feel like the circus came to town. Be there or be square. I can't wait for it. Thank you again. And we will see you next week here on the State of Wrestling as part of Not Sam Wrestling. Thanks for listening. Follow at Not Sam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe. This has been Not Sam Wrestling. Not Sam Wrestling.